I truly think are a college campus's most valuable untapped resource. Hi, welcome back to my channel. I'm Sophia and today I'm going to be going over my top 10 tips for pre-med students that you're not going to find on any guide and no one's going to really tell you but they're going to become really useful throughout your four years and especially when you apply to medical school. So for those of you who don't know me, I just graduated from Washington University in St. Louis and I'm going to be starting medical school at Columbia Medical School. I applied to 35 medical schools during the 2023-2024 application cycle and I ended up getting 14 interviews and 6 acceptances. If you want to know the full results of my cycle, be sure to check out my video on that. So for the tips I'm about to introduce, I would say that the earlier you learn them and start to apply them, the greater the benefits you'll see. With that being said, let's get started. Tip number one, stop majoring in biology. This is definitely going to be a controversial take, but I think one of the biggest disadvantages pre-med students can give themselves is to become a biology major. So when we talk about pre-med, pre-med itself at WashU and at most schools is not a major. Pre-med is a set of requirements like biology, bio lab, chemistry, chem lab, ochem, and so on that you must take in order to apply to medical school. So as long as you meet these requirements, you're free to major in whatever you want. I see a lot of students default to being bio majors because they think it's going to be the safest bet or because they think it's going to be the most helpful, but I'm going to tell you why that's not really the case. First of all, biology is one of the toughest majors out there. In my opinion, the amount of time required to study for upper level bio classes is a lot more than, say, an upper level psychology or an upper level education class. Also, because there are so many pre-meds who are bio majors, the majority of the people that you're going to be competing with in your bio classes to get a good grade are going to be other pre-meds. And this is gonna make it much more difficult to be the best of your class because everyone in your classes are gonna be focused a lot on getting a good grade and trying to be the best. Versus in other majors, the students pursuing those majors are going to go for careers where grades are important, but they're not the end-all be-all like pre-med is. And so students in those majors are gonna be a lot less competitive about grades and therefore make it easier for you to stand out in your class. Another reason choosing a different major than biology may be a good idea is because if you major in something that you're really passionate about or have an interest in, it's going to make it easier to study for those classes. So if you have a passion in history and you've always liked listening to history podcasts, studying for your history courses is going to be a lot easier because you'll want to be learning about it. Of course there's going to be people who say, oh, but I'm passionate about biology and that's what's going to be easiest for me to study. But once you're actually taking a course load of bio, bio lab, biochem, ochem, you're not going to be wanting to study even more biology than that, at least in my opinion. Finally, majoring in something other than biology is automatically going to give you something more interesting about your application when you apply to medical school. I was actually a psych major at WashU, and that was a topic that came up in a lot of my interviews for medical school. And you can imagine that if you were an econ major or a poli-sci major, that would be even more different than bio, which is what most people are, and so that would make you more unique, and that would make interviewers more intrigued by your narrative and your application. Of course, there's going to be a lot of successful bio pre-meds out there, but I think majoring in something other than bio can give you a little bit of an edge when you're applying to medical school. My second tip is to make a four-year plan. As soon as I knew that I was going to WashU, I went to the WashU website and tried to figure out all the information that I would need to create a four-year master plan of how I was going to space out all my classes, all my extracurriculars, and all my research. So things that you need to think about when you're creating a four-year plan are what are the requirements for your major? What are the requirements for your school? When are you going to take all your pre-med requirements? What sorts of extracurriculars are you going to do? And how are you going to get clinical and non-clinical volunteering, shadowing, study for the MCAT, and research? Another thing to consider when you're making your four-year plan is what are you going to do with your summers? Summers are going to be a great way to rack up hours in whatever activity you do, whether it's research or volunteering or working or a combination of the three. So it's really important to figure out what you're doing for a summer before it gets to summer. Otherwise, you might miss important deadlines like 
research fellowship applications, or volunteering applications. For me, the summer in between my freshman and sophomore year, I used that to study for my MCAT and I did a little shadowing on the side. In the summer between my sophomore and junior years, I did research and I also worked at the clinic. And in the summer between my junior and senior year, I continued to do research and that was when I was applying to medical school as well. Of course, things are gonna come up and you're not gonna be able to follow your plan exactly how it is. And that's why it's important that every semester during the time that you're registering for classes, you relook at your plan and make tweaks if necessary. This way you can stay on track and on top of all of your things that you need to do before you apply to medical school. Tip number three, join a productive research lab. Research is an important component of a medical school application. It's not something that every single pre-med has to do, but I would say that the majority of pre-med students do do some form of research. And picking the right or wrong lab is going to make or break your research experience. For a lot of pre-meds, when I ask them why they want to join a particular lab, they say that they're really passionate and interested in what the professor is doing. Unfortunately, I think this passion and interest may be a little misguided because for a lot of the research that pre-meds do, especially in wet lab or basic science research, the topics that you're conducting research on are going to be incredibly, incredibly niche, like maybe on just one receptor or one gene. And it's hard to be really passionate about this one specific gene if you haven't done research in the field for like 30 years, like the PI has. So I would argue that a better way to gauge whether or not to join a research lab is to see if it's productive and it's gonna give you what you need out of it. So there's typically three things I would guide pre-med students to look at when you're considering joining a lab. Number one, is it gonna give you experience? So for most labs, the answer to this question is going to be yes. If you join a lab, the professor is probably gonna give you a little bit of responsibility and tell you what hours to come and what you should do. The second thing to look for is whether you can make a good relationship with the PI. Chances are he or she is going to be writing a letter of recommendation for you when you apply to medical school and you want this letter to be as strong as it can be. One of the ways you can strengthen this relationship is to increase your commitment. So spend more time in the lab, stick with the lab for three or four years over your entire undergrad experience, do research over the summers. Another thing that will strengthen your relationship is if you're working directly with your PI. Some labs will have grad students or postdocs that you might get pushed to work with instead. And while this is also fine, I find that it's most successful for a letter of recommendation if you're working directly with the person who's going to be writing it. The third and most important thing you wanna be looking for when you join a research lab is productivity. When I talk about productivity, I'm talking about research output, AKA publications. You really wanna know if a lab is even open to publishing undergrads. Of course, it's gonna be up to you to make a contribution that's big enough to be put on a paper, but it's important to see whether this lab has a history of even accepting contributions from undergrad students. I see a lot of pre-meds who are roped into a lab and they give hours and hours of their week and they're basically taken advantage of because the work that they do never really amounts to their name on any publications. And so that's why I think it's so important to check this before you join a lab. My next tip is to form relationships with professors early and intentionally. One of the things I talked about when I was talking about research and joining a productive research lab is to make sure that you have a strong letter of recommendation and a strong relationship with your PI. Because letters of recommendations from your professors are gonna make up the majority of your letters of recommendation, they are crucial to making or breaking your medical school application. The words that your professors use to describe you are pretty much gonna be the only words that medical school admissions hear about you that aren't from yourself. So how do you ensure that you have strong letters of recommendation when the time comes? The first step comes before you even meet the professor. So you want to choose classes that you can stand out in. Ways to do this are to pick a class with a small class size. The smaller the class size is, the more likely your professor will know who you are and the more one-on-one -on -one time you'll have with them. Once you start this class, immediately start participating. Raise your hand to answer questions, to ask questions, and to overall signal your interest in the class. Go to office hours to get to know your professor, especially before exams start, and then everyone starts trying to make appointments to go to office hours. If you end up doing really well in a class and the professor knows you, then try to see if they're teaching any other classes and sign up for another one the next semester. If you've taken one or two classes with this professor and they like you and you're doing good in it, ask if you can TA for them. 
Being a teaching assistant for a professor will strengthen your relationship even more because you will probably be meeting with them one-on-one -on -one to discuss your responsibilities. This is what I mean by forming an intentional relationship. It's not just about getting an A in the class. It's about standing out and making sure that you have an actual relationship with this professor. My fifth tip is to study efficiently. The journey from pre-med to physician is pretty much filled with studying. So it's going to be really critical to figure out how to study efficiently. I heard so many students at WashU and just in general complaining about how much they had to study and how they studied eight hours a day and that still wasn't enough to get them an A. In my opinion, everyone who's studying eight hours a day every day is simply not studying correctly. Studying efficiently may look different for every class. For English or essay-based classes, studying might be just completing the readings and then if you have an essay, writing a little bit every day until the essay is due. For psychology or biology classes that are memorization-based, use spaced repetition and active recall to reinforce terms that you learned in class and make sure to study for exams in the whole week leading up to the exam. Break your studying up into chunks so you're not cramming. For physics and math classes, efficient studying will look like doing a lot of practice problems. Basically, there's a multitude of ways to study efficiently, you just need to find the best for you. If you find yourself studying 8 hours a day, take a look at what you're doing and change it up. Tip number 6 is to have hobbies. Medical school applications are looking for well-rounded applicants. Having hobbies is not only going to help you stand out, but keep you sane during your 4 years of pre-med. The rigorous academic demands of pre-med life are going to be overwhelming and hobbies provide a necessary outlet for creativity and de-stressing. Whether it's playing an instrument or doing art or joining a sport, these activities are going to help you be balanced and reduce burnout. I was on the rock climbing team from my sophomore year to my senior year at WashU. I also did a lot of crafting and art and fashion related things. These all helped me connect with my friends as well as relieve stress. I picked up rug tufting while I was studying for my MCAT and I'm pretty sure that was the only way I was able to study for that long. All of your hobbies are going to make you a way more interesting candidate in interviews. My hobbies came up so much in every interview that I had and they really showed that I had a life outside of pre-med and studying. My next tip is to stop over committing. So on the flip side of having hobbies, you don't want to have too many activities that you are committed to. Focus on a few activities where you can make a strong impact. The quality of the activities that you join are way more important than the quantity that you have. It's good to choose a few key activities that you can stick with throughout your four years of being pre-med. So many students come in as freshmen and they see all these opportunities and they think all of them are going to be so good for them and so they overcommit themselves. This quickly leads into burnout in all areas and academics will suffer as well. While initially it may be helpful to join a lot of clubs and see what interests you, you need to drop a lot of these commitments and just pick the ones that really you can stick with longitudinally. Longitudinal activities are the ways you're going to rack up hundreds of hours in the same activity and those are going to look way more impressive than if you have like 20 hours here and 20 hours there on your applications to medical school. My next tip is to choose classes based on work and difficulty, not just interest. It's great to take classes that you're interested in, but make sure you're also considering how many hours of work are you going to have to do for this class every week? How difficult are the exams going to be? Having a solid GPA is going to open so many doors for you when you apply to medical school. While medical schools have a holistic application process, a lot of schools still have GPA and MCAT cutoffs. So it's important that you protect your GPA as much as you can. Some courses might be insanely fascinating to you, but they may come with an insane workload that just wouldn't be worth it to risk your GPA for. At WashU, we were allowed to take one class every semester pass fail. So if you are really interested in a class, but find that it's really difficult, maybe switch to pass fail if you can. Basically, it's important to strategically choose your classes. Every semester when it was time to register for courses, I always went to WashU's course evaluations to search for how difficult past students perceived the class to be, how much work they had to do, and what the grade breakdown would look like. This is ultimately what helped me maintain my 4.0 GPA throughout college, and I'm sure helped me get into medical school.
My second to last tip is to study abroad if you can. Studying abroad for me was such a transformative experience. It broadened my worldview so much and it was brought up in my interviews every single time. Many of my interviewers were physicians and med school professors who were very well traveled themselves and so it was really cool to be able to relate to them in the places that they've been and they were really interested in my experiences. Specifically, the program that I did in DIS Copenhagen was a pre-med focus program and we got to do so many health-related things and it opened my eyes to how healthcare exists all around the world, not just in America. I was actually able to go abroad twice, once through DIS Copenhagen and once through SIT Samoa and this took extreme planning on my end. But if you're able to fit it in your four-year plan, then I would highly recommend both experiences. My last tip is to befriend upperclassmen. Upperclassmen have been through what you are experiencing. They can offer valuable advice, share resources, and help you avoid common pitfalls. The pre-med advising and other advising teams at WashU helped me in some ways, but I would say my upperclassmen friends really helped me make my four years at WashU a success. I truly think upperclassmen are a college campus's most valuable untapped resource. One way you can meet upperclassmen and get their advice is to join clubs and organizations that have family structures. So at WashU, when I was a freshman, I joined a PAMSA and they put me in a family. And my family's great-grandmother and grandfather and mom and dad, they helped me so much in choosing classes, choosing labs, choosing extracurriculars. Of course, don't just take from upperclassmen, give back when you have the chance. Buy them lunch, buy them coffee. And when you're an upperclassman, be sure to mentor underclassmen as well. Those are all the tips I have for you guys today. If you're interested in getting personalized pre-med advice, I am offering consulting. You can check out more at my website, which is linked in my description. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe. Leave a comment what you think I should make a video on next. Follow me on Instagram at xosophiaxu. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye!